um, your hands grabs. So I, I use this opportunity to present our next speaker, Dr. David Ragland. Uh, Dr. Ragland, he's a writer, scholar, and activist with a focus on racial justice, reparations, and abolition. He is a co-founder and co-executive director for culture, organizing, and reparations at the Truth Telling Project, and is currently the director of the Grassroots Reparations Campaign. Dr. Raglan is also a special advisor to Congresswoman Cori Bush and a number of progressive political candidates throughout the US. In the aftermath of Mike Brown's, Mike Brown Jr.'s murder in Ferguson, Missouri, Dr. Ragland and Congresswoman Cori Bush founded the Truth Telling Project to help community members control their own narrative, document abuses by law enforcement, uplift stories, uplift members, and stories of those who experienced police violence and heal from past and ongoing trauma through truth telling. Additionally, Dr. Ragland serves as Director of Reparations at the Jubilee Court of Justice, an impact investment firm supporting regenerative agriculture throughout the southeastern seaboard and critical education for traditional wealth holders. Most recently, Dr. Ragland is a founding member in the creation of the Kibilio Community and Farms Collective a queer Black-led international intentional community focused on healing and reparations. Georgetown's University Advocacy Lab included Dr. Ragland's research in which was named among the most important research on advocacy in the last 40 years. He was recently inducted into Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Collegium. So help me to welcome Dr. Ragland. It's so good to be here and be back and good to see the folks who are in the room who are in the room. And good to be with old friends. And I feel um, a deep connection to uh, this university. One of our, the organizers that I work with graduated from NEIU. Um, and your president is from East St. Louis, right near my hometown. And uh, we got to see her uh, when she visited us in Ferguson. And um, also missing um, one of my other friends, uh, Dr. Chris Tofolo, who's usually here, um, but it's so good to be here. Um, and I also, when I talk, I also begin with the land acknowledgement. And I'm going to look at the program again, because I haven't timed myself when I gave this talk. So I just need to take a look at it. Okay, I got some time. It's hard book here. Um, so I, I wanted to talk about the, the theme of this um, particular conference uh, from Roots to Reparations to Trust Building. And I wanted to begin with uh, some starting notes or um, a starting acknowledgement. And a friend of mine, um, Stephanie Morningstar, who um, leads the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust um, said to me, a land acknowledgement is more than words. It is a prayer, um, an intention to address the ways indigenous genocide and enslavement of people whose blood was spilt on this land must be honored 
and I think that I know that we are on, we are standing right now on the bones of people who were murdered, uh, killed through direct violence, biological warfare. Um, even scientists suggest that the genocide of indigenous people on this land, in in this in the Americas, kills so many people that it caused a global cooling. Um, so as we think about um, genocide and in this topic, I think as we acknowledge. Let's make our prayers and acknowledgement more than that, but action. Action that looks like land back, land rematriation. Um, that's a big part of my organizing and reparations and resource redistribution. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And also just name um, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer in her book, Braiding, Braiding Sweet Grass, wrote, in the settler mind, land was property, real estate, capital, or natural resources. But to our people, it was everything. Identity, the connection to our ancestors, the home of our non-human kinfolk, our pharmacy, our library, the source of all that sustained us. And so I think we should think beyond land as property, as assets, uh, but, and let's go back to the previous slide, to the first slide. Sorry, we're still on the first slide. We haven't gotten there yet. Okay, okay. Perfect. Cool, cool, cool. As well, I want to welcome my own ancestors into the space. I'm a child of um, my grandmother, Goldie Adams, and Moselle Miller. I carry uh, them with me. They're at my back. I'm standing on their shoulders. I'm standing on the shoulders of so many other activists. And um, I am listening to their voices. So the theme of this conference, um, from roots to reparations to trust building, is especially important given the world we're facing now um, and the ideas that have been am animating my research uh, and my thinking. And as I think about that topic, I think about the term Sankofa, just to go back and retrieve so you can go forward. Um, and also Ubuntu, which Dr. Janine has so beautifully uh, shared in her own research, um, because they are so much um, about this work and so much about uh, where we have to go. Um, in this, also in this particular moment, many of you all uh, know that just two days ago, we commemorated uh, the assassination of Malcolm X. Uh, he was assassinated February 21st, 1965. Many folks know Malcolm uh, through this widely known juxtaposition uh, between he and Martin Luther King, uh, which placed them further apart than they actually were. Particularly because we know, which I'll talk about shortly, about the work um, advocating human rights and trying to interrupt genocide that Malcolm X was engaged in. But may, not many people know that Martin uh, tried to name the civil rights movement a human rights movement. Uh, but media and, and many folks 
use that language of civil rights. And there's reasoning behind that. And we'll, we'll dig into that. Malcolm specifically attended to hold, attempted to hold the United States accountable on the world stage for its human rights abuses. And he used a Pan-African framing uh, to situate black, the black liberation struggle in the US as global and connected to the freedom efforts on the African continent and in diasporic communities around the Western hemisphere. At an organization of Afro-American Unity Rally, which is an organization he founded after he left the Nation of Islam, on July 5th, 1964, Malcolm X spoke on the need for an international approach given the absence of human rights protections for Black folks. He said, you and I have to make it a world problem. Make the world aware that there'll be no peace. He said, no peace on this earth as long as human rights are being violated in America, then the world will have to step up and try to see that our human rights are recognized. Over the next few months, Malcolm pushed African heads of state to endorse a call for the UN Human Rights Council to investigate the United States and its failure to protect Black folk from human rights abuse that were often sanctioned by the US government and other state institutions. Before that, 71 years ago from today, in 1951, William Patterson and Walter White and Paul Robeson offer petitions. And we know about these petitions because Many of the many folks went back to the UN recently over the last couple of decades with recharge genocide. And Paul and others compiled documented evidence of lynching and racial violence, charging that the United States government with genocide and seeking redress. Lynchings, widespread police brutality health and educational disparities, political disenfranchisement, all constituted the legal definition of genocide as per the then legal definition of genocide by the newly formed United Nations. While these charges were never taken up by the UN and Eleanor Roosevelt famously ridiculed um, and called these charges ridiculous, um, further engagement with this human rights framework continue in the U.S. civil rights movement. Both Malcolm and Paul were seeking relief from an international community because despite the U.S. and the lofty values at home, Black folks and non-white folks too were under the boot of tremendous brutality. Um, and black folks like my father, who grew up in Brownsville, Tennessee, picked cotton until he was 14 years old, had to leave the South under the threat of certain violence. So within people who are alive, people who are currently alive, experience this brutality, it's deeply connected to this ongoing, or what some people call way in the past, but this lingering slave culture in this country. But leaving the South, coming to St. Louis, Missouri, he experienced a new form of racism or racist violence that was in the North.
many like my dad left the South escaping Southern terrorism just to come here and experience more. And so as we think about this legacy of Malcolm and Martin, and even as people were fighting and struggling against our state institutions that propagated such violence, Malcolm's death was the result of the US infiltration of our movements that were resisting Jim Crow and pushing for human rights. I don't know if people saw the news lately, but uh, Malcolm's daughter um, has recently noted that she will sue federal agencies uh, for their participation um, in his death. But the violence of Jim Crow, the violence of American policing continued through the Black Power movements and saw thousands of activists murdered by police and law enforcement up through Ferguson, continuing to this day. Or we saw Mike Brown murder, Sandra Bland, and so many others. Even after Breonna Ta Taylor and George Floyd was murdered, we see state-sanctioned state violence continuing. Just in 20, uh, 2022 alone, there were more murders um, um, than ever reported uh, by police. But not just that, there continues to be a ceaseless infiltration of law enforcement into our movements that continue to stifle our communities and see people placed in jail and prison. Even as we're almost 25 years into this current century, my friend and one of the old other co-founders of the Truth Telling Project, Congresswoman Cori Bush, had to recently demand that the FBI release their surveillance records on her while she was protesting in Ferguson. I believe that Malcolm X and Paul Robeson showed uh, us that and Black folks in the diaspora and that we were not alone in this struggle because they were fighting alongside those brothers and sisters throughout the diaspora and the continent and teaching us how to use international frameworks, albeit hypocritical, to address crimes against humanity. It's important, but also embarrassing so much so that after Malcolm took his demand to African countries to support this demand for UN attention, the civil rights bill was passed in the US so as to take away attention to this international work as a consolation prize. But notice how it was a civil rights bill, not a human rights bill. Even though we know the problems of human rights, uh, decolonial scholar Julia Suarez Crabb argues how human rights discourse was and is still rooted in racist constructions of the world. But as the UN as an important instrument, even if only to garner attention about injustice has played an important role in addressing genocide and conceptualizing reparations. Following the UN conference, and I'm, I'm not there yet, I'm still on this one. <laughs> Sorry, we gotta keep going back. Um, Following the UN um, conference uh, in Durban, 
on racism, which the U.S. and its delegation walked out on, um, we saw the creation of the UN decade on people of African descent, the end of a, to apartheid, um, the introduction of the truth commissions in South Africa. And we also saw uh, the, the creation um, of an approach to reparations that the United Nations described in five areas. And they looked at reparations as compensation restitution, satisfaction, healing, and guarantees of non-repeat. I'll describe these shortly, but I just want to name that this broad approach to reparations, which looks at reparations beyond money. Money is necessary, but not sufficient. As my friend Willard Lett from Incobra often says, that this is full reparations. And in COBRA, which is the National Coalition of Blacks in America for Reparations, look at these five areas as full reparations. And for me, this piece uh, about reparations opened me up to thinking about what reparations um, actually is. Um, because I always knew it was compensation for enslavement, but it made me think that reparations was more, much more deeper, especially given this international human rights context and given all of the people like Malcolm and Martin who both spoke out for reparations, although that part of their work is unknown. But in the spirit of Sankofa, I'll speak about reparations through some of our ancestors who worked on reparations. All right, here we go now. Um, so in the spirit of going back to reclaim this past, to move forward, I want to think about Cali House. Cali House founded the um, National Ex-Slave Mutual Relief and Bounty and Pension Association, seeing that uh, people who were recently enslaved um, didn't have um, any resources. Um, and so she began an organization um, aided by a congressman uh, to support um, Black folks being able to have money uh, when they could no longer work or resources when they could no longer work. Unfortunately, uh, the U.S. government decided that because she was a Black woman, that this had to be fraud. And she was eventually imprisoned in Missouri uh, for uh, two years. And uh, she was charged with conspiracy because people sent money through the mail uh, or she was charged with mail fraud and conspiracy because people sent money through the mail uh, for this pension fund. One of the other ancestors that I want to think about is Queen Mother Audley Moore, uh, who lived from 1898 to 1997. And she founded what is the precursor for INCOBRA, which is the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. And in 1963, she founded the Reparations Committee for the Descendants of American Slaves, which sought $500 million as partial compensation for her historic injustice. Um, and there was a filing of at least one lawsuit for reparations in a California court. Then George Foreman. Uh, many know George Foreman as a, a SNCC activist, but in 1969, after the Black Economic Conference in Detroit, he and other activists uh, went to New York City at uh, the famous Riverside Church to interrupt the Sunday service 
and demand that Christian churches, quote, white Christian churches and Jewish synagogues, which are part and parcel of the system of capitalism must begin to pay reparations to black people in this country. And so in addition to this, besides the call for democratic rights, freedom, justice, uh, equality of social opportunity, employment opportunity and equal education and an end to police brutality and racial violence, um, we, have the Black Panthers 10 point program, which is very similar to the demands made um, at the Detroit gathering. Another ancestor that I wanna name, I don't have an image of here of her. Her name was uh, Queen Mother Abuchi, but many know her as Dorothy Benton Lewis. She was an elder in Encobra. And she wrote Black Reparations, Religion, and Faith, Raising the Contradictions. And I thought this was extremely important to, to think about this, this kind of religious framing of reparations, given um, that reparations or that slavery and colonizations were first justified by the Pope in his papal bull where he told initially Portugal and Spain to conquer, go conquer, enslave uh, non-Christians um, and their lands in perpetuity. Um, and if we look at the um, historical founding of many uh, of the religious communities in this country, they relied and used, directly used, um, colonization um, to garner land. For instance, uh, the crown was giving Christian churches a uh, hundred crowns to bring back um, a scalped head, uh, a scalped body, uh, body parts of indigenous people. Um, and many churches use uh, body parts that they gave to the British crown uh, to build uh, their church. Um, in addition, if we look at even in the US, the Anglican church, uh, which are connected to Episcopalian churches and Episcopalian churches, um, they created the slave Bible. Um, and the slave Bible excluded all references of liberation. And the slave Bible was propagated in the US South and the Caribbean. We have to go back and retrieve what was lost. Even in the, the Quaker tradition, the Quakers who introduced um, uh, a petition at the US Continental Congress to immediately stop slavery, uh, their own founder uh, owned um, and refused to um, manumit or let uh, enslaved people go um, after his death. And so for me, um, when, when we began this, this work around reparations, we used the international framework uh, of reparations, which I've named, it looks like compensation, restitution, satisfaction, um, healing and guarantees of non-repeat, which I'm gonna get into. Um, I thought it was important to frame this um, not just as a political answer um, and an international instrument, but also as a decolonial tool. Uh, particularly when we think about compensation for reparations, we know that compensation is necessary, right? Not just because there's a wealth gap, Right, a wealth, it's important. And, and we know that the wealth gap is an indicator of all uh, uh, vectors of success and even living a decent human life with capabilities and the functionings necessary. Um, yet, 
it's just a starting point, right? It's a, it has to be a starting point because when we think about wealth, this wealth is stolen. And while it is necessary to live, it's important to acknowledge that it's stolen, but still demand it. So compensation is important, but not sufficient. And then when we think about um, healing, what do we have to heal? The United Nations laid out this um, notion of healing as one of the dimensions of reparations because they understood from looking at uh, the, the trauma and genocide and violence that they were dealing with in, in Rwanda and uh, many places around the world, uh, the former Baltics in Europe, um, that there had to be healing. Um, if there was not healing, uh, then there would, uh, people would continue to suffer. Uh, people would not feel repaired and that healing had to happen uh, because people were suffering from intergenerational trauma, um, from uh, being separated from families during enslavement, from rape and child trafficking. I think it's important to name what actually happened during enslavement and um, that enslavement continues, right? After, um, after, um, the Emancipation Proclamation, um, there were exceptions to slavery. Uh, there are exceptions, and, and even in this day, only a few states have ended those exceptions, which are people are allowed to be essentially enslaved if they're incarcerated. Um, and we also know um, that most of the things that we buy come from dirty supply chains that rely on genocidal violence and human rights abuse to get us cheap oil, to get access to water in other nations, to get access to the core components in our phone. Everyone is benefiting from what is essentially slave labor. If if a uh, diamond is your best friend, then girl, you need to rethink that. But at the same time, reparations is more than just the healing and the compensation. It's restitution, the return of what was stolen. It's also satisfaction, which we know from the work in, of the organization of the reparations now movement here in Chicago right, who have been pushing that there be a torture curriculum um, in uh, K through 12 education, but which still, as far as I'm understanding, hasn't been, um, hasn't been enacted. And if folks don't know, the Reparations Now movement in Chicago uh, was a result of John Burge, who tortured African-Americans, um, and he was a Vietnamese vet, a Vietnam vet. And uh, for decades, he tortured people. And he was still never really held accountable. Uh, but activists uh, did push to uh, get reparations for those tortured vic victims. So satisfaction it involves truth telling and acknowledgement. And then for me, one of the most important aspects of uh, reparations is guarantees of non-repeat. And guarantees of non-repeat repeat means changing uh, laws and the system that made the violence um, that we're requiring reparations for possible. And I, I like to use this frame, right? When we talk about guarantees of non-repeat, it's basically don't do that shit no more. What does it take to not do that shit anymore? Uh, and, and that's a question for us. What does it take to not do that? What is the shit that we've done? And part of it is genocidal violence. 
that has brought us here. Um, and let's think about the U.S. Uh, from Raul Castro's book, Exterminate, I'm um, sorry, documentary, Exterminate the Brutes, this filmmaker who also uh, did James Baldwin, I'm Not Your Negro, suggested that the Revolutionary War jumpstarted the U.S. as the world's leading arms manufacturer. that Europeans mistook military supremacy um, for intelligence and cultural superiority. That Darwin was able to convince racist imperialists that genocide was just part of progress. And this is partly taken up in Nelson Maldonado Torres's book, against war and the underside of modernity. In this view, if you didn't agree that genocide wasn't part of progress, you were just uneducated, warranting more violence, more enforced silence. And this is partially why we created the truth telling project in part to uncover historical silences, his, to uncover the truth that communities are experiencing um, as they watch their families mowed down by police and then told that you good. No, no, just we shall overcome. Let's do some reconciliation. So as we were talking about truth and reconciliation in our community, I noticed that many of the white liberals we're saying, well, why don't you just forgive? How do we get to reconciliation? And this is why initially we were gonna call ourselves the Community Institute for Truth and Reconciliation. And we said, we're gonna stick with truth telling because we're not there yet. And it wasn't until I started thinking and organizing around reparations that I understood truth and reconciliation even more that Reparations has to be the midpoint between truth and reconciliation, because how do you ask people to reconcile with people who they've never been in relationship with, right? A relationship that a relationship of injustice is not a real relationship. And so um, for me, I think it was, we thought it was super important to think about truth telling in this context and also to think about reparations as a part of a reconciliatory or conciliatory process, but also the importance of reparations as more than political, but a spiritual practice that had to get to the very core of who we think we are as a society. Because when we encounter our creator, the question won't be, were you just a little complicit in injustice? It'll be, how did you unravel yourself from complicity of harm? From the complicity that causes the murder of people and continents. I'm gonna be honest and I'll close on this. I think that reparations is an opening for accountability for people who have been led to believe that they're omnipowerful, for people whose egos and hubris have gone unchecked for centuries, and that that reparations is a chance for people to come clean and to teach their children the truth, All right? Because your children will come back on you if you keep lying to them. All right, thank you all. Okay.
Thank you very much, Dr. Ragland. We couldn't have imagined a better you know, opening um, speech and featured uh, uh, speech. So, um, Dr. Ragland will have uh, at least uh, five minutes, uh, five to ten minutes for uh, for your questions, which I believe um, are many. We have two questions. Okay. Okay, uh, let me bring the microphone so you can read it aloud. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Thank you. And, and there's not a lot of people here, so you can just stand up and say it. And, yeah. oh. oh, okay. Hello, hello. Okay. All right. First question was What was the name of the Vietnam vet that needed to be held accountable for genocidal acts? The name John, was, was it John um, Bulge? John, let me look. John Bulger or John John Bulge? Uh, yeah. Please, yeah. yeah, and and Google it too. Yeah. Just look up torture Chicago police. That's our only question for now. The next, it was a comment. The next one says brilliant observations by the speaker. Okay. Thank you very much. Wonderful. We have, uh, you said, um, I think, I um, can't remember the question, but you say that uh, the um, United States uh, you know, ratified the Civil Rights Bill in order to prevent uh, the uh, mo uh, movement for human rights. So um, my question is, uh, are both of them mutually exclusive? Uh, or aren't you in by proposing this, uh, devaluing the uh, intensive work done by Martin Luther King in order to to bring about uh, the uh, civil rights? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a good question, and one of the things that that um, that I've learned in in some um, just over the years is that um, the, so Malcolm X was speaking to and visiting a number of heads of states of uh, uh, recently um, independent um, African countries and encouraging them to support this resolution at uh, the UN. And um, if you see any movies where you see Malcolm in Egypt, it, you know, in Ghana and, you know, him with the camera, but also being followed. Um, at that same time, the, the U.S. did not want him to connect uh, with these newly independent countries for several reasons. You know, they were claiming that, um, well, you know, they're gonna make black people socialists and you know all this stuff. Many, many uh liberation movements at the time were using Marxist ideology and rooted in Marxist ideology. And um the US didn't want black folk to be exposed to that. And I think that while there are elements of human rights in the civil rights movement, and not to diss Martin Luther King because he spoke out on it and he was a reparationist and he's much more radical and even much more socialist than people actually name it if you i don't know if you all know but during martin's lifetime there were posters all over the country saying that this man is a communist this man is a socialist right um and Martin, well, well, the, the U.S. government, like, passed the civil rights um, legislation because they didn't want to deal with human rights, Be and, uh, and partially because they didn't see us as human, right, and, and, and which is also connected to why other groups have gotten reparations and why we haven't. You know, it is still a gap in the European imagination about Black folk, um, about are we really human? Um, and that's that's clear in, in my recent treatment at the hospital, going through root canal and being denied pain medicine. 
and dealing with extreme pain um, that people cannot see our humanity and are unwilling to, even at this date. And this was in Western Mass when I had to go to the hospital. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just naming we are, there was an explicit denial and movement away from human rights because human rights is at that point, even as articulated on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights included economic rights. And the U.S. was unwilling to go there with us. Thank you very much, Mr. Raglan. What can you tell us about the family values of the family who of the people who supported Malcolm X and Martin Luther King? If there is a literature on that, could you please let me know? Sure, there's a new book out right now about the mothers of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X that folks should read. And I think people deny, you know, particularly our, our movements are often focused on the men who lead and not the women who have been holding it together and putting their bodies on the line. And even at the March on Washington, women weren't allowed to speak. Um, um, and so I, I think that it's deeply urgent uh, that we name that and also name our queer family too, who have been organizing alongside us and caking for us while even within our communities, we deny um, those folks. Um, and so if I, I believe that we can only get free together um, that our movements, we have to see how they are intersectionally connected and move together because, um, you know, you can't get free alone. <laughs>